This is Robert Kraft, and I'm your host for a brand new show that we are exclusively hosting on the SNN Network YouTube channel. This is the Investors Roundtable, where once a week on every Thursday, we get together with a few people you may recognize that I've interviewed over the years from either the Planet Microcap podcast or Wall Street View, or who knows, you may have seen me talking to at a conference somewhere down the road. And uh, it's our chance to really talk about some topics that all my panelists here want to get more insight uh, about, or uh, just have a general conversation and really just, you know, catch up. I mean, look, it's been a while since all of us have been able to get together, go for a beer and talk about stocks. It's something that we all love to do. It's where we go and learn. And we, I thought that it would be really cool to share that experience with you. So with that, episode one, here we go, Investors Roundtable. Everyone who's here, thank you for joining me on uh, this first Investors Roundtable. Thanks for having us. Hey, Bobby. Great Thanks to have you, Bobby. It's, it's awesome to have you guys here. I'm, I'm really stoked. And uh, I'm going to go one by one so that everybody who's watching this, you kind of know who's talking. Because I don't think with Zoom, you can see the little names. So one by one, uh, we got Adrian Day from Adrian Day Asset Management. Kevin Shea, who's full-time microcap investor, also contributor to microcapclub.com. Thomas Backrack from PFH Capital. Do a little, do, do a little this. Come on, everybody. All right. And then uh, <laughs> we also got Jerome Neymark from One Main Capital. We also got Mark Tobin from Coffee Microcaps. And Kelvin Sito from... Uh, Oh my gosh, Kelvin, tell, tell me the name of your firm. Right? Cause I know you're, I know we go by your, you know, sling, slingshot, slingshot cap on Twitter, right? Yeah, I think that would do. Yeah. Okay. All right. Slingshot cap. And then we also have, uh, you know, this, this is a nobody, you know, uh, he's, I've only had him on a couple of times. A uh, guy named Sam Namiri, Ridgewood Investments. What's up, Sam? Hey, Bobby. Thanks <laughs> for having me again. All right. So I want to dig right in. You know, the, as I said, the, every week we're going to be going over a few topics that everybody who is available to, to join us for this panel today uh, uh, wanted to submit and talk about with the rest of the panel. So this is actually something that a few of our panel members sent in that uh, it's, more, it's more or less the same. So I'm going to throw it. Let's throw it to your own. Uh, you, you sent in this topic. So the uh, floor is yours, man. Awesome. So, yeah, I mean, I guess the topic... I want to discuss is just um, how everyone's thinking about how much exposure they want to the market right now, given everything that's going on. And I guess just kind of laying out the backdrop. Um, I mean, I, everyone really knows the situation, but like there's a lot of uh, economic uncertainty right now that's been driven by COVID. And a lot of that uncertainty has been partially offset by so far by fiscal and monetary stimulus. And um, on the fiscal side, it just so far it seems like absolute demand destruction has been, uh, for the most part, prevented by the government writing people stimulus checks. And you could see that um, in a lot of discretionary spend buckets, um, you know, other than the stuff that's been shut down, like I follow the boating and RV and ORV and housing space. And like the demand in some of those sectors is off the charts strong. So you could see that consumers are still feeling pretty confident and they're spending money. And um, on the monetary side, you basically had the Fed coming out and saying, we're not gonna allow an economic crisis to turn into a financial crisis or a banking crisis. We're not gonna allow there to be liquidity issues at banks. We're gonna make sure rates are lower for longer because the growth environment and the inflation outlook looks low. So we're gonna, we're gonna be very supportive of, of basically um, uh, rates and, and you know companies borrowing and liquidity and stuff like that. So um, clearly, um, both of those actions, both monetary and fiscal, they've had an impact of inflating assets um, so far, asset values. And to a large degree, that inflation has come in what I would call like the secular growth stories. And that kind of makes sense to me. I mean, if you have um, basically you have revenue and profit trajectories that are unchanged for the most part, in some, in some instances, they've actually accelerated because of COVID. And now you can discount those consistently growing earnings at a lower discount rate. So it makes sense that you would end up with a higher current, you know, current value. Um, but that, that that's also left in the dust. You know, those, those have left in the dust, like the cheaper, more cyclically exposed, what we would call like value type names. And um, 
And a lot of those obviously like lower rates don't necessarily impact their valuation as much because um, lower rates come with a weaker economy. And so you have a lower discount rate, but you have probably a, a, a worse earnings outlook for them. So it kind of makes sense they've been left in the dust. But the thing that makes it difficult for me is normally when there's this much uncertainty in the overall market and economy, the overall market multiple is lower. And so um, I think now with a high multiple that's being dragged up by all these growth companies, like clearly if those things roll over because the economy does weaken further and investor expectations do get worse, like all the cheap stuff is going to roll just as hard with it. It doesn't matter what the entry, entry multiple is. So like on a mark to market basis, you're still going to take a big hit. And that leaves me with this like constant question of like how invested should I be and how much cash should I be sitting on in the, in the scenario where things do, you know, really get worse and the whole market does start to roll over driven by all the stuff that have recently been inflated by the fed. Um, and so I mean, my current thinking and my thinking really hasn't changed much since this all started is I've been sitting on a lot of cash waiting for opportunities and, you know, I've let the cash balance run down um, in mid-March and early April and now it's back up to, you know, where it was um, when the uncertainty, you know, started popping its head out. Um, but at the same time, that cash is earning zero. You could make the argument that like the market already knows that this is an issue and it's a, you know, the market's a discounting mechanism. And um, I really, I don't think like this whole second wave situation is like the first wave. I think a lot of people were caught off guard about these mass closures in the U S like people were like, Oh, it's happening in China. But like, I, I think once people started realizing, Oh my God, this is going to impact the whole world. Then you could say you had a variant view from the market. And that's kind of why the market and people, you know, people were more exposed to the market in February as well. But like right now, I don't really know what could make the market roll. I just know that if it does roll, it's taking everything down with it. So we'd love to hear everyone's view. I mean, my view has kind of been consistent in keeping a big cash balance, but um, it's earning zero right now. So we'd love to hear what people think about that. All right, I got I got Kelvin's hand is up first. Kelvin, do you want to do you want to go first? Uh, is, is that me or is it Kelvin Shay? No, no, Kelvin. Oh, okay. Uh, I, oh, I, I think I must have accidentally pressed it, but uh, yeah. I mean, my my view about the the market, I think um, rightfully uh, I think this is, I mean, having investing for quite a number of years this is one of the most difficult uh periods I would say uh when it comes to this this amount of uh economic data that we have to actually uh, wrestle with, right? Um, but from my point of view is that I I do feel that because the market the economy is a complex. A, you know, adaptive machine that you know it, it gets you know it gets harder and harder to read the situation, and because of that, I I feel that you know um throughout my investing periods is that when I started out investing, I was really trying to read the situations a lot, and as I was doing that, increasingly I find that it's a lot harder. You know, it's a lot harder, and I find that as the markets get a lot more complex, I think that you know I in my I mean so far in the way how I'm investing, I've been. Uh, fully deploying a lot of my cash, putting them to work. And for me is that I, I don't try to read the market situation as much, but I would feel that, you know, if the market is going to be a lot harder to read, then the amount of uh, due diligence in the companies that I'm researching, is going to be even more, um, I mean, the requirement is going to be a lot higher. And, you know, I was just, you know, just trying to pull up some information because I was just recalling previously what I was reading. Um, so Fidelity actually once said that, um, you know, if you look at the stock market itself, if you look at the returns that you derive from the stock market, it's probably, um, you know, out of the whole year, it's probably about the best 50 days actually contributes most of your returns in the calendar year. And, you know, for me, if I'm holding cash, that means I'm actually pricing myself out of the environment. So I think for me, what has proven to be really useful is uh, I think exercising a greater sense of discipline. And I, I think that while it's... Um, it's normal for, I think, a lot of people to look at the market situation, try to read it and try to uh, adjust for cash positions. But I think ultimately, if you are buying quality uh, companies and we have uh, strict discipline on it, you know, I think eventually we'll still do very well because uh, I have this analogy to share because just imagine that we have, uh, let's say we are driving cars, right? Uh, we, we want to reach to a certain destination. Um, there's two scenarios we can have. One is that we wait for the perfect weather 
uh, to drive the car. Or another one is that we know that there will bound to be a rainy day, there are bound, there are bound to be bumps along the way, there, there are bound to be potholes along the way. But having said that, I think that, you know, instead of waiting for the perfect environment or a better environment to, you know, deploying our cash or to drive, you know, if we still drive a car that we still meet the rains, we still meet the bumps, eventually we'll still do much better because staying vested and, you know, being part of the company's growth, um, I think that would actually serve, uh, I mean, personally, uh, it has worked really well for me is that having a strict discipline and having a stricter uh, company uh, selection process instead of reading the market too much. But, you know, I'm really interested to hear uh, what others have to share as well. So, so I think Tom was next and then Adrian. And then Seth. I'm really good at Zoom, as you can see. That's why my response time is so good, Bobby. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I, I, I see so many bargains out there right now. So, like, I, I you know, I kind of, you know, I, I guess I'm, I'm bottom up. And um, so, you know, I try to stay away from the macro. I'm really interested in it. I love talking about it. And it informs my beliefs in terms of maybe I'm looking at industry A or industry B. But in the end of the day, I'm bottom up. Um, I see unbelievable number of bargains right now. Um, Bobby, you know what I'm about to say next. Uh, none of them are in the U.S. And none of them were in the U.S. last year. And none of them were in the U.S. year before. I, I think it's at a point where, you know, I, I, uh, the, the two or three names I'm looking at and deep diving right now are, are one of them's one times EV to NOPAT, one of them's three times earnings. They don't have debt. They have good ROE. Um, but they're in weird places and, and you kind of got to wander off to go find them. Um, I, I just think the U S markets in a very funky situation. Uh, I, I know everyone submitted topics here and, and there's going to be some fed bashing later, I think, which I'm looking forward to. Um, and, uh, but, but I mean, I just, I, I just think like, I mean, I don't know like if I was just looking at the U S market right now, I, I don't know what the hell I do. Uh, you know, what are you going to do? You're going to go cash and, you know, get crushed if inflation kicks in. Not saying it will, but there's no risk of it priced in. Um, you know, you want to go in like, well, you want to get like the, the, you know, Vanguard, the bond, like BND, the ETF, BNDX, the ETF. You know, I think that thing's got like a half a percent yield to maturity in like eight years of duration. So it's basically you're, you're agreeing to a loss. You know, it's, it's I, I can't think of a worse thing to buy. So I think if you're looking at equities and you're willing to go off the grid a bit, I think there is value out there. Um, and hopefully it holds up over the, the long term. It probably won't over the short term, you know, but it's kind of how I feel. Well, we're now getting to the Fed bashing. Adrian, floor is yours, man. Well, no, just because I ask a question about the Fed doesn't mean I'm going to bash them. I might be very supportive. You don't know. <laughs> this is true. Um, I take it back. Well, I'm not talking about the Fed now. That, that'll that come later when I've warmed up. Um, I, I basically agree with everything everyone said so far, um, which perhaps is a bit dangerous. You know, I, to me, the way I look at it from a macro point of view, and I love talking macro just as you do, um, Tom, but uh, again, I'm a bottom-up investor um, at, at, at the core. But, um, you know, there's so much uncertainty out there. Um, we all have our own views on whether we're going to have a second wave or whether there's going to be a shutdown and how are restaurants going to respond and, and are people going to go to sports stadiums again and so on. But, but, but there is a lot of uncertainty. And I think there's also a lot of divergence. And that divergence will become even clearer after the second quarter earnings come out. I mean, um, the first speaker mentioned a few industries and sectors that were doing well. And then you think of restaurants where margins are extremely slim to begin with. They've been locked down in many parts for three months, where I am, Puerto Rico. They've been shut down for essentially three months. They're now allowed to open with 25% capacity. Most restaurants simply cannot make money on 25% capacity. Now, the guy, you know, the local restaurant I go to a lot, you know, he said, oh, I call my landlord. You know, he owns most of the restaurants on this block. And he said, oh, don't worry about your rent this month. Oh, don't worry about your rent next month. But that's not a forgiveness. Once the restaurants open up and things are back on, he's going to come around and say, hey, where's my rent for March? Where's my rent for February? 
So there's a lot of industries and a lot of sectors that are really, especially small businesses, that are, and not only small, some of the large restaurant chains, are truly going to have a great deal of difficulty um, coming back, I think. So uncertainty and divergence. The way I look at the market, I mean, I'm a value investor um, at heart. And value, as many people will tell you, you know, um, people who don't like the value approach, many people will say, well, that doesn't tell you whether the market's going to go up or down next week or next month uh, or maybe next year. No, and that's absolutely true. Markets can stay overvalued for a long period of time and undervalued for a long period of time. But to me, value is the start. Value is where I start from. Um, I mean, we all know the reasons why the market is going up. I don't think, certainly the U.S. market, I don't think it's because there's a great deal of bargains out there with the S&P trading at 24 times forward-looking earnings. These are the earnings that have anal analysts have already cut for the shutdown, right? And we're still at 24 times earnings. I know interest rates are low, so you have a high multiple, I realize that. I mean, the main reason the market's going up, two reasons, is the Fed is pumping up liquidity in. And secondly, there's nowhere else to go because everything else is earning you no, no return. You know, you don't put your money in a CD and hope to, hope to get rich. So, so we know why the market's going up, um, but op opposing that is the fact that the market's expensive, in my view, and the fact that second quarter earnings, in my view, have not been fully, dis the, the pain has not been fully discounted. And so I, right now, I mean, I'm just extremely cautious on putting money to work. We, we were invested in March. I mean, it was clear at the bottom in March that there was going to be a recovery rally. Frankly, it's gone on longer than I thought it would, I'll be honest. But, it, 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 you know, anyone who's been around the market a long time knew that the second week of March was a good time to put money into the market. But I've been taking money out recently. Um, we are, and I'll wrap up on this, we are far more disciplined and selective than, I won't say the normal, because that makes it sound that I'm not normally disciplined. But we're extremely disciplined and selective right now. We're also a little more short-term oriented, to be honest. Um, uh, the SEC doesn't like me mentioning individual stocks that did well for some reason, so I can't see what they are, but of, of, let's just say cruise lines. You know, we made some good money on cruise lines in a very short period of time, um, but, but I wouldn't want to hold them for the next six months. And the other thing we're doing, frankly, is um, again, looking around the world, uh, as Tom said, for good opportunities, good values. And then lastly, we've been selling puts a lot because puts at this time have just incredible premiums because of the volatility. So you can sell short-term under the market puts on things you wouldn't mind owning anyway. That's the way we do it. It's not a speculation in itself. We're, we're, and and you, can, you can often pick up 5% or 10% in one month if you go even on under the market puts. Well, that's not bad. And so that's basically what we're doing right now. It's funny you mention that. I'm actually putting out an interview next week with Matthew Peterson from Peterson Capital Management, where he deploys that, he's been deploying that strategy since 2005. <laughs> so it's pretty- Well, pretty one of the things we've been yeah. buying, for example, we've been buying, we've been going along the volatility index. And the way our, our strategy is to start by selling puts, under the market, just sell puts, and it depends on the environment. Right, right now, it looks like the market's maybe going to recover a little bit, so you don't need to go too far under the market. But today, the VIX was at uh, the VXX, the ETN was at uh, 34 or something. We were selling two weeks out, we were selling 31s, which is over 10% below the market, and we were getting a dollar 12 from. And this is 10 days left because they expire on the 2nd because of Independence Day. That's pretty darn amazing, frankly. And then when they're put to us, if they are put to us, we immediately turn around and sell calls. And the calls might be one-week calls, two-week calls. But again, you get the same kind of, of return on the calls, and we just wait till they're called away from us. And then we do it again. All right, so Sam? You had your hand up next? Yeah, yeah just, just on that, uh, for retail investors, I don't recommend necessarily selling puts unless you know what you're doing. Um, you know, the, you, you have to end up having the money to be able to buy the underlying stock. 
some point. So um, just just a little warning there. But yeah, this is a great strategy. And then also it doesn't really work well for micro caps because there's not really an options market. Um, but again, for large caps that works. Um, but I think just to be, I think your own just kind of answer your question about how I look at it. I generally like to have like 10 to 15% of cash at any time. I mean, if you feel the markets are expensive, I'm sure you can find, I don't know if you short, but there's probably some good companies to short out there right now with, with, you know, not, not anything based off that they've run up so much based off of no fundamentals whatsoever. Um, and so I would hedge that way. And then, um, yeah, I think, I think that's really the, the, the two things again, like, I think we have some, I'm pretty sure we have a position that we both share that's pretty big in both of our portfolios. Um, but there, like, if you find something at today's price that you think is a double, you know, granted, it's not much nicer to be able to pay less to get the same, the same company, but I don't think you should worry about that. And, and if you're a long-term investor, again, looking out two, three years from now, um, and again, like even longer term, if you're looking out five, 10 years from now, the market is very likely going to be higher than it is today. So if you have a long-term mindset, you don't have to worry about this stuff, I think, in the short term. And Tom, um, I know you mentioned, you know, you, you look outside the U.S. to get to find opportunities, but that's, that's what microcaps are. You know, they're great opportunities even in the U.S. So a lot of un, uh, under, underfollowed, undercover gems out here. So um, that's, that's kind of my two cents on it. Nice. All right. So, uh, Mark, you had your hand up for a while. Go for it. Yeah, I think, um, you know, on portfolio, whatever you want to call it, optimization management on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I'm a bit like Tom, you know, I like starting like bottom up. Um, my only kind of macro overlay I put on is like, okay, is the company and the sector got like, you know, a structural growth story behind it or a structural decline in front of it, you know? Has it got a headwind that's like, you know, pushing the whole sector and every company kind of in it, you know, it's kind of giving them a, a boost as opposed to, you know, them all facing some kind of a kind of a headwind. And then in terms of, you know, cash, yeah, I generally have cash in my portfolio um, because I don't want to be fully invested for the sake of being fully invested. That's, you know, just me. I, you know, I, I want to commit something that I think has, uh, you know, a, a chance to like really kind of deliver you know, a good return for me. So, you know, I generally have cash in there, waxes and wanes. Um, and then, you know, when things are getting expensive, like I'm a big believer in trading around in your portfolio. So, you know, let's say you have an intrinsic value or, you know, okay, I think, you know, I think this is a fair multiple for it, given whatever, whatever, and my target price is X, you know, if it gets 10% beyond its target price, trim it down a percent. If it gets 20% beyond your target, trim it down another. And you kind of keep going till it's maybe, you know, 40% ahead of your, you know, target price. And if it was a 4% position in your portfolio, you know, you're, you're down to zero um, in terms of that. And, you know, you can redeploy cash into something that's not running with the market. Um, or if you find like a better idea. So I think, and, you know, if it, if it kind of goes the other way, you know, um, if it hasn't ran, you know, keep adding to it. Now that's not to say my intrinsic value is static. I'm looking at that every day to think, you know, is the economy going to affect it? Um, you know, have they done something stupid capital allocation wise? Uh, have they reported good results? Have they reported bad results? So my intrinsic value is, you know, it's, it's constantly changing and, you know, I'm thinking about it is, you know, is this the right multiple for it? Uh, you know, are my assumptions kind of correct? But, you know, there's a lot to be said for, you know, flexing up and down the weighing in your portfolio as things get, in your view, overvalued or undervalued um, without having to be all or nothing. I'm in cash or I'm invested. So that's kind of the way I think about it and manage it. Got it. All right. And, uh, and Kevin, your thoughts? On mute. Uh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a bit different than most others. I'm obviously an individual private investor <clears throat> and um this, this this topic started out with your own asking about uncertainty and speaking more about <clears throat> uncertainty than and how do you address it and, and 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 in my case i almost discount the entire macro because i know i can't control it um <clears throat> i have chosen to go into a much shorter profile of time to um, to invest in so at this point in time i probably have about 50% of my investment in long-term microcap investments. 
many of them I'm pretty familiar with in the long term. But what I've done is, is that I have really have changed my strategy somewhat and have gone into short term trading. Um, and I've been trading a lot of the COVID stocks because I believe that they give you the biggest return as a investor trader, not to be confused with something that's you know, trying to create a portfolio that's a long term portfolio. So to that extent, what I've been doing is, is um, doing a lot of swing trading in some of these markets. And it's just shocking you can make 20, 30% a day in some of these things if you hold them correctly. So as, a, as, a, as an investor trader, uh, that's how I've spent my, my uh, allocation is, <clears throat> it goes back to what your own said, <coughs> excuse me, that um, there's too much uncertainty out there for me to be holding things that are macro. Um, I can't control it, I don't know. I don't know what it is, to be honest with you, from a standpoint of what you, how you guys look at things. <clears throat> I look at it as a, as a um, what stocks and what, what areas of investment can I get into that will make me um, money. And actually, I'd be very, very short term on it. I, I, will, I will stop out on everything. I, I will not let my money uh, ride uh, because of the uncertainty again. Again, go back to what your own said. The uncertainty is there, it's certain. That's the one thing that we all know, it is uncertain. And I just wanna discount that as much as I possibly can so that I can control what I want. So um, that's where I'm coming from at this point in time. As, a, as I said, I'm, a, I'm an investor trader. I do have, I still have a, a uh, four or five long-term holds that I have on micro cap uh, types of companies, but probably 50% of what I'm doing right now is um, <clears throat> short-term trading. Um, again, it's it's um, it's my it's my profile you now different than yours, but that's what it, that's how I have been looking at it. Are you trading microcaps? Um, not many. I'm trading mostly. First of all, what do you have? I have a I have a, a wish list. I mean, a watch list of of, of COVID stocks, and um, and I'll trade those. Some of them are, some of them are microcaps. But what I've gone to these days is I will not trade anything that's illiquid. Um, if it's, if it's not, I, mean, I have scans going on right now that basically is telling me if it's not a, if it's not a half a million shares a day, I probably don't want to be in it because I want to be able to get out because of the uncertainty. Again, again, the, the, your own made it perfectly clear. Uncertainty has to be addressed in some fashion with the, with the strategy or a policy or whoever you want to address it. My strategy is don't get involved with things that I can't get out of as soon as I want, as soon as I can, things of that type. Sam, yeah. Got it. Well, you know, it, Kevin, you, you made a good point because, you know, your, your perspective, look, you're a private investor, you know, you have, you can be, I think, a little bit more flexible in that sense, you know, almost everybody else here, I think, runs a fund, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. And you that's know, how what, yeah, that's what I want to make the sense of, Bobby, is that I'm much more flexible than other people who have funds or who have portfolios that they have to manage or something of that type, <clears throat> when they're also restricted. Um, I'm unrestricted. And so from my perspective is that, um, uh, how I approach things as an individual uh, will differ from many of the people who are on the panel today. Got it. Well, so this actually kind of ties into our next topic because as Kevin said, you know, the only thing certain is uncertainty. And this, and this next topic, it's gonna to be a combination of what Tom and, and Adrian really brought forth. And it's really talking about from a macro level, talking more about, you know, uh, Fed Reserve policy, not bashing, Fed Reserve policy, I promise Adrian. Uh, and, and, and understanding that a little bit better. So, um, I mean, I, and Tom, correct me if I'm wrong, would you say that's more or less what your topic was too today? Uh, yeah, no, no, I, we definitely uh, overlapped uh, significantly. You could, you could freely merge them. All right, we're, merge, we're merging topics. We're merging Fed, Fed Reserve policy. So, Adrian, you want to give us a little bit of a background on what you're seeing right now in terms of Fed Reserve policy and how that's affecting both your strategy and maybe some others around you? Oh, gosh. Um, I was hoping Tom would go first. That is a huge topic. Um, <laughs> you, you know, I think what we've seen increasingly over the last, really over the last 30 years since Alan Greenspan, is we have seen the Fed um, become the lender, not just the lender of last resort, but become uh, but, but basically have a put, a put on the market. So but when things start to go wrong, the Fed is there. And of course, it started with Alan Greenspan. We had long-term capital, which was, in my view, um, one of the most disastrous uh, things the Fed ever did. 
um, because it set a precedent. And so from then on, increasingly, you have had the market participants correctly assume that the Fed will always be there to bail them out. And what that means is that people take increasing risk because risk becomes asymmetrical. You, you, you get rewarded if you're right, but you get bailed out if you're wrong. Um, and I'm being simplistic there, of course, but, but increasingly that's been the approach. And, and from Alan Greenspan onwards, it's only really got worse with um, uh, both the Fed's approach to the markets because in my view, the Fed shouldn't be shouldn't be concerned with markets at all. That's not their that's not their job. That's not their mandate. With ever lower interest rates, and with ever easier money every time something goes wrong or goes potentially wrong. And we saw that very very clearly at the end of two thousand eight. You know, the Federal Reserve in two thousand in two thousand fourteen. Right, the Federal Reserve said they were going to normalize policy, reduce the balance, normalize interest rates, and reduce their balance sheet. That was in 2014. They took the first tentative steps two years later, two and a half years later, at the end of 2016. First tentative steps, and by the end of 2018, when the Fed, when the market had a hissy fit, um, they abandoned that policy and reversed course again. And I think it's, it's very, very important that people, from a macro point of view, it's very, very important that people realize and truly understand that the Fed was already on an extremely easy course well before COVID and before the shutdowns. That only exaggerated it. But if you look at the period from September with the overnight repo market, and, and that's a whole different issue, of course, because we can we could have a separate discussion on why was there a problem in the overnight repo market? Why wasn't JP Morgan stepping in to buy um, overnight obligations earning 10%, right? In a normal circumstance, a bank like JP Morgan would definitely do that. On reasonable credits, they would take 10% overnight. But stupid Fed policy prevented them, prohibited them from doing them. That's why we had the that's why we had the overnight repo crisis in, uh, in the first place. And from September to December, the Fed was already the easiest it has ever been. The easiest it has ever been. The Fed created more money, if you want to put it that way, created more money in those three months than they did in 2008. So we were already on an easy path uh, be before the COVID hit. And now, of course, you know, we have QE infinity and we have the Fed talking about possibly going to negative interest rates. So if the Fed could not pull back from what from QE1 and QE2, I ask the question, will they ever be able to pull back or how will they ever pull back from QE inf infinity? Um, and, 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 and my view is that they will only pull back, not because of a desire, not because of a will, but they will pull back because of some crisis, because they have to. There's a big debate, and I'll end on this, there's a big debate as to whether this is going to lead to inflation or not. And a lot of people say, you know, why should we have inflation? We didn't have inflation after 2008, and look at all the money that was created then. There was a huge difference, though. In 2008, all of the money that the Fed created went to buy, back tre went to buy treasuries and mortgage-backed securities. All of it went to either the federal government or to the money center banks, all of it. And the money center banks had no incentive whatsoever to lend that money out to Main Street. In fact, they had a, a negative um, incentive to lend that money out because they were blamed for the crisis in the first place. And so the banking examiners were breathing down their necks about making loans. And so it was in the bank's own interests or it was in the banks, the bank had the incentive not to take risk on lending money to Main Street. And on the contrary, they had the incentive to put money on deposit um, after, 2000, after the first quarter of 2009, when the Fed introduced what I think is the craziest policy they have ever introduced. And there's a lot of competition for that. But they decided in the middle of an economic downturn to pay banks interest on excess reserves. Now, if your aim 
is to help the money center banks, that's a reasonable policy. If your aim is to get the economy recovering, that's just about the most stupid thing you could possibly do. Because banks literally, for three years, banks could lend money, well, for, uh, actually up until 2016, Banks could literally lend money from the Federal Reserve at 0% or an eighth of a percent and turn around and put that same money back on deposit with the Federal Reserve as excess reserves and earn an eighth or a quarter or three eighths of a percent. So they had a risk free, literally risk free return, assuming that the Fed was going to pay them back, a risk free return on however much money they could borrow from the Fed. So there was no incentive to lend money. And, and that's different this time because so much of the money is going directly to consumers, directly to small businesses. I mean, we can argue about, we all know about the problems with the PPE and all that kind of stuff. But a lot of the money is actually going to small businesses and to businesses in general and to consumers in general. That means that that money is, is much more likely to end up in the real economy. And even though we've had a slowdown in demand from COVID in many sectors. Um, where, where have you gone? Everybody keeps switching around. Oh, there you are at the bottom. <laughs> um, you know, you mentioned, um, you mentioned uh, the increase in supply, the pickup in demand. I mean, the pickup in demand in certain sectors. And that's absolutely true. Many sectors have seen a pickup in demand. What we forget, some sectors have seen a decrease in demand, but what we don't always focus on is that there's also a decrease in supply and so we are likely to see in my view we're likely to see more demand less supply which potentially leads to inflation six or nine months down the, down the road and that just wasn't true in 2008. Thank you Adrian for that. Tom did, you know you pretty much hit on your topic that you <laughs> that you were talking about so yeah, you know, so do you have any thoughts? Right off the bat, I, I agree somewhere between 95 and 100 percent of what Adrian said. Um, I'd have to parse it out to figure out if it's 95 or 100 uh, percent. It's but so he, he said he said most of he said a lot of kind of what I see, and I, I'm going to try to kind of um, you know you know not say all the stuff stuff again, but try to try to round some of the topics and some of my feelings on it as well. Um, I, I've not been an end end of fetter anti Fed guy my whole life. Um, you know, part of that was um, I probably disagree with myself and where I was years ago, but also just as the latest behavior from them is just it's hit another level. Um, so the, the you know the what really started to get my attention is you know just you know when the economy's bad, it's okay to run a fiscal deficit, it's okay to drop the rates, but you got to sacrifice and hand that back when things get good and. and for whatever reason, we ended up in the tail end of 2017. We're talking U.S. here. Um, we had basically full employment. We passed tax cuts. I, I love the idea of tax reform, simplifying tax code, but that could have been deficit neutral. It wasn't. Um, we ran up our fiscal deficits. And then we had, you know, and I want to get into politics here. I really don't want to get into politics here, but it's hard to, it's hard to say without saying the guys' names. You know, the market would go down 5% and you were getting tweets at our chairman, you know, cut rates, cut rates. And the guy freaking listened, you know, and he did it. And that's, and at a certain point, it's like, we have like what sub 4% employment, unemployment right now. Um, we're running a significant fiscal deficit and now we're dropping rates. And, and now we're going to walk into a crisis like COVID with that. It's, it's just appalling to me, you know? Um, you know, in the early 80s, when, you know, we were coming out of stagflation um, in 82, I was born in 82, this is what I'm told happened, uh, that we actually sacrificed as a people, and we took some pain for a while, and, and President Reagan actually gave cover to that, because he had courage and bravery, and Volcker was fantastic, and I don't see any of that these days, and it's, 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 it's a little bit um, disappointing to watch, and, and, and what I'm wondering is, you know, there are a lot of people, anytime you say, um, here, let me go back, and I'll go back here. There's a, there's a tweet I was going to share. Um, you know, you know, Bobby, with your uh, production value, I'm sure you can, like, pop it up on the screen or something. 
over my face here for when it actually comes up. So, but that, I'm gonna read it for that's now. Re that's for episode two, okay? Like the, oh, okay, okay, yeah, yeah. We, we we don't have the technology for that yet. So so I'm gonna <laughs> so I'm gonna read it though. It was from uh, Jeffrey Gunlock at his account Truth Gunlock, which is a great name for the record. He said, uh, and I'm gonna read. It. I got another screen up here. Why bother with any taxes at all? If Chair Powell is correct that there's no limit to expanding the Fed's balance sheet. Implicit in his declaration is the whole tax collection system is a royal waste of resources. And he's right. Like, no one has an answer to that. Like, it's like, why do we have taxes? Like, why even bother? And meanwhile, we see, like, an MMT theory popping up, and we see lots of people who just say deficits don't matter. And, and I, I, you know, it brings up the next kind of extension, I think, to this discussion, which is the U.S.'s currency as a as you know, the US dollar as a global reserve currency. You bring that up um, to a lot of economists, they look at you like you're, you're, you're insane. But you know, throughout history, we've seen monetary regimes change. I don't see any reason why that can happen again. Um, and you know, I look at this, and again, I wanna come back to Chairman Powell. You know, he made a statement uh, that was essentially like, I have no limit to, to you know, what I can do here at the Fed. There's no limit to what we can do with our balance sheet. Um, they were said, I'm sure to stop, I'm sure the SP 500 was down like, you know, 0.5% after hours or something. So he had to, he had to step in and do something about it. Um, so, you know, they, they, they basically said that. And if I'm like, if I'm, you know, countries overseas, you know, like the people who have currencies that our dollars are priced against, right? Like, how do I, how do I not look at that as him basically calling me a bag order? at a certain point. I mean, you're basically saying, right? You're basically going like, hey, we've been running like fiscal deficits twice as large as in any other major country for the last two years. You know, we pay uh, way less in taxes as a percent of our GDP. Cause hey, we know you guys are a bunch of bag holders. We'll just, you know, if we, need, if we get a pinch, we'll just, we'll just shove you a bunch of the uh, global reserve currencies. And, and, and there's this idea that we already have a basket approach in a sense in the world. Like the US, you know, if you look at, FX reserves, the US dollar is like 60% of them. What if it's 50%? What if it's 40%? What if it's 30%? Like, why wouldn't these countries look at us and look at our fiscal policy and start to have a problem? We ran, I think, a 7% deficit uh, related to GDP in 2017. I think it was 5% in 20, oh no, that was 2018. It's 5% in, in 2019. Um, I can't find another major country that was over 3%. If I look at the OECD countries, the, the average uh, fiscal deficit was negative 0.3%, meaning they basically had balanced their budgets, which I don't think most Americans are aware of. Um, yeah, at what point are they looking at us? So this year, I think the latest forecast this year is we're going to be up to about 18%, which is a, uh, a peacetime record. Um, I'm sure that'll be in the 20s by the time the CBO is done with that. Um, you know, at, at what point do people look at us and start saying like, hey, you know, these guys are not entirely being super free trade friendly, not, not, you know, not balancing their fiscal books. Maybe we should underweight their currency a bit. And, and, and what kind of domino effect could that trigger? I'm not saying it's going to happen. I have no idea what's going to happen, but I can, I can look at the market and say, hey, it's not certainly not priced in. So, um, I think that was kind of my, uh, that's kind of what I'll add to what Adrian said. Fair enough, fair enough. Uh, Mark, I, I see your hand raised here. So uh, you have thoughts on the topic? Yeah, um, hey, look, I'm not a Fed expert, uh, even though I did a master's in economics or fiscal policy, it's a long, or monetary policy, it's a long time ago now. But, you know, when the chairman said what he said, I was there, Jesus, is he playing golf with, the newly retired Mario Draghi, because that's exactly what Draghi said a few years ago. Hey, look, we will do whatever it takes. And, you know, basically the whole European debt crisis, just people just went away. And it was like, you know, it was like game on in, in kind of global equity markets and definitely European equity markets. Um, where it could go, I don't know. Well, Europe's mostly negative interest rates. So, you know, as if this is Fed policy now, you know, how do we look forward? I think if you look forward into Europe, you know, post Draghi's comments. I think that'll give you maybe an indication of where the future is. And if you want to go another step forward into the future, look where Japan is. Um, you know, they've got 240% debt to GDP. I think the US is like 
closing in on 80 or 90, you know, somewhere around there. But, you know, and, you know, the funny thing is I checked up just before this call just to see, you know, Japanese equities, we take the Nikkei, you know, 225 versus the S&P 500 dividend reinvested all in dollars. It's actually only slightly underperformed on an annualized basis, you know, the S&P over the last decade, even though you would say, at, you know, 240% debt to GDP, this is like a basket case. But that doesn't mean, you know, equities are going to not be a good investment. Um, and then, you know, for somebody who lives in Africa, you know, we don't care anything about what the US is doing. You know, people here want to get their money into dollars as fast as possible. Um, because most of the stuff that they trade in, um, oil, you know, a lot of stuff that comes that, you know, they're net importers of, of US products and, you know, people generally trade in US dollars, you know, shipping globally is priced in US dollars. So even to get it to you is priced in US dollars. Um, and, you know, until there's that shift away, you know, I remember, so maybe Adrian can remember better, but, you know, there was a shift to pricing um, commodity contracts and futures contracts in euros for a while. It didn't seem to kind of build up any head of steam. Um, and on your OECD thing, uh, you know, I agree with you, but, you know, and the European Union, I think, but looking at those headline numbers, it's just dominated by Germany. France, if you want to go to fr France, hasn't had a budget surplus since 1973. That was the last time they run the budget surplus. I think the US, the last time they did the budget surplus, correct me if I'm wrong, I think was the back end of Clinton, somewhere around there. I think, you know, in, in his second term, I think they ran small surpluses. So, you know, Germany, it covers a lot of ills and, you know, the whole European debt crisis with Greece, Italy, Spain, uh, Portugal, you know, that, you know, those big numbers at the headline level are kind of obscured by how well Germany runs its affairs um, across the OECD and definitely across the, across the EU. So I don't know if that adds to the discussion, but I think maybe just gives a, a different viewpoint and context ar around what you're saying that, you know, what the Fed does, yes, I'd say keep it in mind. And, you know, maybe there's other places to, to look at like Europe and Japan um, but I think, you know, it, and, you know, monetary systems come and go and, you know, currencies come and go, but, you know, still today, you know, the U S is still the largest economy in the world, you know, it's still the reserve currency. And I can tell you, there wouldn't be a single country in Africa who wouldn't be, you know, trying to get more dollars and would love more dollars in their kind of reserve basket and definitely wouldn't be thinking about swapping into pounds or euros or yen by any great stretch of uh, moves, you know, going from 60% to 20%. Um, so when you've got that kind of global context um, and, you know, these things shift in very glacial type movements, you know, <laughs> as they all say, you know, in the long run, we're all dead and, <laughs> you know, it, it could be beyond our lifetime before that change actually happens and you could miss out on some kind of equity investment return or taking advantage of the fact that it's not changing and just, you know, not fighting the Fed. Absolutely. And, and real quick, I know Adrian and Tom, I know you guys have your hands up, um, but I, I do want to move on to the next topic. Um, unless you guys have some really quick to, to wrap this one up. Oh, Adrian. I can, I can do something real quick. You want me to go here? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah, quick, quick reply. Everyone brings up Germany and stuff and France. And um, I actually agree, I agree with a lot of Mark's points in there. Um, France's deficit was 3%. They were the worst country in Egypt, or not, I said Egypt, I used to live there, in Europe. Um, you know, most of the, like, there were a lot of them, 1%, 2% deficits. And there were a bunch of ones who were positive. I mean, I think, I think, I think uh, Norway ran like a 7% surplus you know 2018 so like i mean a lot of these countries i think as a whole i i think we're we're caught in 2014 15 it's at, at points like a lot of them actually kind of straightened their budgets out now now and now this year they're all going to be running mid to high single digits but the u.s is going to be 20 percent um i guess my point is that you know people said a lot of the same things about the british pound a long time ago 
And I totally agree. I, I don't know if this is going to be 50 years, 100 years or what. Um, but what put the U.S. here originally is we basically got all the gold <laughs> after World War I. All kind of came over. You know, we went through a series of different policies and Bread and Woods came. And then that got kicked to the side in 71. And, and you know, I, I think the world is changing. And, and I, I'm not investing around this. But I'm wary of it, and especially how it affects us the next 10, 20 years. Um, that makes sense. For sure. All right, real quick, I want to move, so I want to move on to our next topic. Um, this is something that I think we've all been seeing, uh, uh, you know, in terms of now we're, you know, especially if you're on FinTwit, um, we're seeing a lot of a shift and a lot of new retail investing happening over the last few months, whether it's because you know, everyone's at home quarantine and they want to pick up a new way to make a couple bucks and, and want to pick up day trading and whatnot. You know, uh, Sam, you kind of brought this topic up. Do you want to kind of lay the groundwork and, and uh, love to hear from your own Kevin and, and Kelvin on this one? Uh, yeah, sure. So, um, I mean, I, I think a lot of us have noticed there's some stocks, especially in the microcap world, that just fly <laughs> in one direction based off of the news, right? Like, if after the riots, if you do anything with police departments, you know, the stock skyrockets and you know, way above anything that could be ever really imaginable in terms of a, a real valuation that the business can or should get. Um, and so I kind of wanted to know, like, you know, if anyone had thoughts as to you know, how to play it, how to play it, if there's certain ways to play it, I, I have some strategies um, I could I can start talking about maybe. Um, you know, a lot of these companies do equity raises, right, <laughs> right after that happens. Um, and so, you know, I read a lot of the documents there and see when do lockups end, um, you know, when do warrants become exercisable. Sometimes, you know, if, a, if the stock is above a certain price for a long enough period of time, it, it rushes the expiration or sorry, it rushes the exercisable date of the warrant. So a lot more stock becomes freely tradable. Um, and so, you know, you can take advantage of it, you know, now, now that they want to sell the warrant. So. You know, that, that's one strategy I use. Um, but yeah, I mean, just kind of like understanding kind of, you know, we, we live in a different world, right? Than what happened, what, what the world was like pre-March or whatever, pre-COVID. But, you know, how do things, well, the other thing I, as I think about is how do things kind of balance out at the end, right? Like if you're a tech company and you do virtual stuff like Zoom, you know, you have you hit peak Zoom or, you know, like, when things level off and people start going back and meeting in person and traveling again and business traveling, you know, where do things end up? And so I would love to get your guys' thoughts on to, um, you know, where, you know, if, if you were investing in the long term, how, how you would think about that? Kevin, you had your hand raised. Um, Sam, I just wanted to make a comment on something that had to do with your initial statement. Um, things have changed dramatically. The, the volumes of these stocks are going ridiculously high. Um, I've actually gone into conversations with different people who are either day traders or swing traders or something of that type, trying to figure out whether or not there is a, is, there is a, a fundamental change or a shift in the marketplaces. One of the things that um, continues to be notable is this Robin Hood effect um, and whether or not that Robin Hood effect is something that is um, new that has to be addressed or is just uh, another element that has to be factored in when you're looking at uh, trading with E-Trade with e or Ameritrade or someone else. Um, um, my thought is that, you, I think you used the word, maybe you were thinking the same thing, how do you play against uh, Robin Hood uh, when you read about these people and find out that the majority of them are, are sheep investors? Um, so, the, you know, there's a, there is a strategy and, and it's, the other thing that goes in there also, if you're looking at, at the way in which the market is being uh, turned upside down, um, literally the, the place in which you're making money is between 3.30 in the afternoon and 10 o'clock in the morning. Uh, the market has completely flipped that uh, all the money is made in the first 90 minutes. Uh, I should say even almost the first, first 30 minutes and the volumes are absurd. Um, so I think that's one thing. And you mentioned about the, the, the you know, um, DGLY, um, I forget the name of the company, but uh, you mentioned the clap stuff. and. Um, all of a sudden that went up, now it's all coming back down again, and of course it's gonna be shorted to hell. Um, so yes, I think that there is this uh, short-term um, 
um, I don't know what it is. It's, 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 it's a new short-term view or everybody's got to make money instantaneously. Uh, if you really want to kind of play it, it's, it's probably one of these, these uh, philosophies that comes with the millennial kind of vision of the world, instantaneous gratification. So, um, you know, going back to what you said earlier about whether or not there are changes and what those changes might be, I think that they're there from a trading perspective, from an investor perspective, you have to consider it. I mean, otherwise it's something that might affect you in the long run. Uh, but that's short term. I think the long term, you mentioned things, um, how do we play with changes? I mean, one of the things that certainly is, is seemingly um, becoming notable are our uh, movements into electric vehicles. Anything to do with electric vehicles is beginning to have, is beginning to have a very long-term impact, a long-term effect on, on investors. And there's a lot of investment going in there. Uh, so I think, again, that's from a longer term, where are things trading? And the other thing, I'll go back to um, um, Fidelity, the guy who was lynching Fidelity, you know, basically buy what you, buy what you, you know, buy the stocks of the stuff that you're owning. Um, I am no longer a millennial, I can't even say it. Um, but I think that one has to look over their shoulder to find out how millennials think, what they want to buy, what they're envisioning things as. And more or less, if you're an older investor like myself, you got to look over the shoulder to find out whether or not uh, you can figure out a way of being able to ride their coattails. Well, Kevin, I, I just want to comment on one thing. You're no longer a millennial. You were. You uh, were I was a millennial were, 100 years ago, then, but I know. As, as, okay. you know the problem I have right now, I don't even remember how old I am. You know, it's like a hundred and I think I'm 120 something. I don't, I don't even remember anymore. You know, you're, you're a millennial to us. I think that's, what's really most important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. <laughs> so Kevin, are you saying you came of age in 1900? <laughs> well, well, I haven't come of age yet. I'm still working at it. <laughs> so uh, I, I want to get your own. What, what's your opinion on what's going on, what you're seeing with, you know, the, this, the idea of what Kevin just brought up, this Robin Hood effect. And as a portfolio manager yourself, I mean, I know you're, you have your more long-term base, but you see some of these things happening. You know, what do you do? Do you just sit and watch yeah. and, and laugh or, or what, what do we do? Yeah, I mean, I, I laugh. I think um, it's borderline crazy to try to fight some of these trends. So if you're trying to short something that they decided to start pumping, I think, I don't know, you have to screw loose or you just like a lot of pain. I mean, maybe you'll be right eventually, but um, I think who was it? it was Einhorn who once said like twice as silly price isn't twice as silly. It's just still silly. So like if something is trading at 50 times what it's worth, like going to a hundred times what it's worth is just as silly as 50 times what it's worth. So like, I think shorting them is tough. But, but just, just, just a comment on that, like something going from 50 cents to $10 I think is a little different, you know, of yeah. the story. <laughs> Everyone has their way of making money. I personally don't have the stomach to try to like fight those battles. Um, I understand how people do and it could be, there could be good opportunities to kind of play against the Robin Hooders. I do think they get more attention than I would, I guess, than, than they deserve personally. Like I do think that there's a small portion of people who have gone to Robin Hood and have gone pure YOLO and are like all in and like they're moving stocks a lot, but I don't think that's indicative of like broader investor sentiment where like, you know, all of the U S or all of the world has decided to like take their cash holdings and plow into the stock market. I think it's like the people who went in are all in, they're using options aggressively. They're looking for the most levered, like crazy beaten down plays that could be up a lot very quickly. And it's, I think it's dangerous for them. I personally like don't think it has as much of an impact on the broader market because I do think at the end of the day, like they're concentrated in the in the crazy YOLO stocks. I don't think like if you look at retail cat again, we're like get, kind of getting back into the macro. But if you look at like money market balances and and other gauges of sentiment, like I don't think like broad based where a place where things are euphoric. And so like I try not to fight what they're doing. Um, I'm long biased. So like if I own something that could potentially benefit from them going crazy, that's great. Um, and I don't think I would try to short anything they're doing, but like, I mean, the, the main thing I, I guess I would take away is, I mean, I found an opportunity that's like a COVID beneficiary last week, uh, or two weeks ago now, and I bought it and, um, 
I wrote it up and I think some people discovered it's a COVID beneficiary. So like if you can, if you can find something where you think over a year or two, it's going to do well, no matter what. And they kind of decide that's a stock they want to start buying. then like, I guess you can get a free win out of it. But for the most part, I try not to think too much about what they're doing because I don't think they're rational. I don't think it's possible to predict necessarily what or why they're doing it. And so I try not to dedicate, try not to dedicate too much time to driving myself crazy, figuring out what they're doing. Hey, what, can one I, quick, can I just jump, oh, sorry, sorry, Kevin. Can you just jump in to me to just, I don't, I saw Sam kind of jump, jump in. Jump. I didn't know whether or not you can just jump in. Is that acceptable? It's, it's acceptable, but we're going to go to Kelvin just after. So no, go for it then. I'm, I'm, I'm good. Let him, let Kelvin speak. All right, yeah, Kelvin, uh, real quick. Yeah, just a quick comment. I think I, I totally agree with uh, what uh, Yaron has said. I think if you look at the swings, I think uh, naturally uh, it would be very tempting. And I think uh, for even myself, you know, when you look at it, um, I think definitely there are some ways to play about it. I think it's a really smart way when you look at the expiry, you look at the issue price, you look at, you know, the lockouts, when is it going to expire? I think it's a really smart way um, to, to get into it. Um, but from my perspective, I think um, the reason why I, I think um, I don't do that because, uh, you know, for the time span and for the returns that is being generated, um, you know, is it going to move the needle in terms of the portfolio? And I mean, there are some names that have obviously have gone up a lot and, um, you know, where we try to add a new style of finding what millionaires are investing in, it might be very tiring. And I don't, sometimes, yes, but sometimes it may not move the needle at all. Whereas if you kind of reallocate your time to doing what has already worked for you and, you know, something you can hold for the long term and ge generates a lot more returns to actually drive the alpha for your portfolio, for your fund, um, I think perhaps that could be a, a alternate uh, solution. So, I mean, just, just my two cents on that, um, on this issue. Gotcha. Kevin, what, and, and what were you going uh, to respond to your own? I'm not quite sure. Um, you know, the, the, no, I'm not really quite sure what the deal is these days because, you know, we're, we're, we're at a stage where we're kind of in a, well, I'm in the kind of situation where I'm looking at long-term uh, opportunities, but at the same time trying to make some fast cash by following these methodologies or these philosophies that are being espoused by um, Robin Hooders. Okay. Um, as I was mentioning, uh, you know, I, I, I did, I do write up uh, micro cap club stuff. I'm slowing down on that, but um, I have one or two or three items that I'm, I still am involved in there. I think they're great companies. I find new ones. Um, so there's still opportunity for any sort of micro cap club or micro cap investor to find um, awfully good, awfully good companies on it. And, I will mention one that I came across just recently. It's called the Spira Women's Health. Um, I didn't write it up. It's a little bit, it's a, I think the micro cap now is like 350 million. <clears throat> it's a nice little company. Um, and you look at, you just look at it. It's a nice little deal. So um, there's still great opportunities in micro cap land out there. Um, and again, it goes back to what Sam was saying is, is that, uh, you know, you still want to be able to look at, find good long-term opportunities, but at the same time, recognize, um, in my opinion, recognize that um, we have to consider whether or not, um, at least in the U.S. market, how the market is being impacted by some of these changes in philosophy. And again, I, I'm not suggesting that, um, uh, that this is, this is um, a, a major driver. I just think that it is something that one has to take into consideration since it is an alternative, it's an alternative to the, to the, um, to the past structure. By the way, um, since this is the first episode, we're now going to try something different. Just feel free to jump in when you have a comment that you want to say, don't, don't worry about your hand raising. So just go for it. If you have something to say. So just on that, I think, um, the, the way I see it is that I think a lot of us have experience doing some due diligence on companies. And a lot of people just don't read, like they don't read the filings, right? So when someone does an equity raise, they don't read to see like, what are the actual terms of it? Um, and so for me, I see it like kind of a hedge. It's a hedge to do it. And then with shorts, you need to have a catalyst because when you holding a short costs money, you, know, you have to cost, there's a cost of interest to carry. So, you know, for me, like I find pretty good opportunities. Um, similar with like Darling IPOs, a lot of times, a lot of the shares are locked up, right? For six months, usually. And so, you know, usually on the six month one, one day, 
it's a great time to short right on the right before that because everyone who's made a ton of money all the employees you know they can they can sell out so um i, I think i've seen similar opportunities here and then also i think going back to our original question where the markets you know like the overvalued of the markets it's it's kind of like it's, it's a tale of two stories right where some companies have come back up if not even more than what they were you know pre-march and other ones are still like 50 percent of that level so you know I, I think like if you short the expensive ones and then you know go along the short ones like i think that could be a an interesting pair trade you know in, in terms of a market um in terms of i guess betting on the average uh, just to jump in on that, Sam, at the same time, is that one of the things that became quite interesting is the way in which the casinos and the restaurants all of a sudden took a, uh, took a, uh, a, a price advance pretty rapidly. Um, again, it's that these, these, it's these, it's these markets that are, that are going to come back some point in time, yet no one, I think, really knows what's the best way to handle them at this point. So, again, I'm looking at that, and I forget who said something about the way in which boating has been um, the 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 boating business has not gone through has not gone through some decline. I have not followed that, but you know again it's one of those things where people here on this panel have insight into how how different verticals or different markets are working, and I think that might be an interesting point of discussion as well. Absolutely. Anybody want to jump in on that, Adrian? I think you were the one that talked about cruise lines and how you, how you you played that a little bit. You're on mute. Let's get you off mute. <laughs> I think he just realized he's on mute. There Sorry, we you, <laughs> Sorry. For me, that was just a very, very short term, um, a very short term trade. I mean, the, the sentiment on the cruise lines was just so bad. Um, it was just a short term trade. That's all. So you were betting that the Fed would step in and bail them out, right? <laughs> All the Saudis would come in, <laughs> or or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we're already gone. That, so that's that's nothing to talk about. That was just an investment. But I do think it's an example of what what we're looking for in this kind of market, and what you can find in this kind of market. And you know, by nature, I'm a long-term value investor. I get my biggest kicks from discovering a company and being able to keep it for a, a long time. I mean, we still own stocks that were the first stocks we bought in 1991 when I started my money management business. We still own them. And that, that to me is a greater thrill than doubling your money in two days or something. But I think in this kind of environment, you have to be a little more, you know, dil um, you have to be looking for those kind of opportunities. You know, a couple of weeks ago, we bought some British pub stocks, for example. Very, very depressed. But it was pretty obvious if, if, if well, for Irish people as well as for English people, it was pretty, pretty obvious that they're going to open the pubs again at some point. And when they do open the pubs, people are going to go. Um, maybe they're not going to go 100% to what they were before, but they're not going to go 25%. They're going to come back. And when you can find stocks trading at three times last year's earnings, you don't really have to have those earnings recover to last year's levels for that stock, those stocks to do pretty well. So, you know, we looked at opportunities like that and you can find them, but you just have to keep looking because I don't think they're long-term investments, frankly. For sure. Any, any other thoughts on what Adrian just said? You know, um, one of the when, when, when do the pubs open? It's <laughs> July the fourth. Oh, there you go. Which I'll be the, there in England. Yeah, really strange. They picked July fourth to reopen the pubs. <laughs> so as my as my brother told me, so we're going to be celebrating Thanksgiving when the pubs reopen because in England, of course, July the fourth we celebrate as Thanksgiving. Just, 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 just kind of on the pub and people going back to them. I talked to a restaurant CEO uh, maybe a few weeks ago now, and it's kind of interesting. I actually have a variant perception on restaurants. I think restaurants, when they come back, are actually going to, again, this is probably like a year or two years from now, are going to come back a lot stronger, I think, than they had historically. And the reason for that is I think a lot of the bad, poorly run, you know, poorly levered um, businesses 
um, they're going to they're going to go bankrupt. So you're going to go into a mall, for instance, that used to have ten restaurants and now will have five. So I, once the traffic picks back up, they have less choice. So you'll you'll probably see you know more crowded restaurants of the ones that remain. Um, and then, yeah. So I mean, I, I think I think that's going to be something kind of interesting to again to see how things pan out. And then also, what what do the rents become for these restaurants? Are they going to is the market going to you know, start pricing the rents lower for, for restaurant space or, um, again, if it's dedicated restaurant space or not. So I think- Let me add to that, Sam. One of the things that's obvious in, in, in many, many cases is that one of the changes that occurred going to occur over the next one to two years is more and more and more restaurants are going to have drive-throughs or pickups or some means of being able to um, address the, 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 what's going on right now. Um, you look at Duncan, which is a, you know, I'm not quite sure, D-N-K-N. Um, they, uh, they almost exclusively are run on, on uh, drive-throughs, okay? And to some extent, I don't know, I haven't followed their revenues, revenue model, but it would seem to me that they're probably one of the better, um, you know, small, I don't know how you, what you call them, they're not fast casual, they're just small coffee places. Um, but again, it's, it's one of those things where, you mentioned it yourself that um, some of the some of the places that do not have drive-throughs probably will suffer badly in the next year or two. So when I look at this thing and say, "Well, if I look at that as being a business reality, um, should I invest in a company that does some sort of drive-through window, okay, as a small as a small microcap opportunity? Um, should I invest in these things where we are perceiving that there's going to be some sort of changes?" to the restaurant businesses, and what are those gonna be? I mean, maybe you've already spoken to somebody for that type. And if you know what they are, um, are, are these these longer term opportunities that are available to you to, to, um, to start looking at now? Yeah, I, I think I just wanna jump on uh, this case. I think Kevin has talked about, um, you know, are there any beneficiaries, right? So um, I currently own a stock, it's called uh, Par Technology. So they're actually serving um, you know, large enterprises, uh, they are point of sale systems and also uh, cloud solutions based and back-end office. And I think the point about uh, parks reopening, uh, you know, in Singapore, uh, that's where I'm, you know, living in. I think the parks have reopened, the crowds were crazy. Um, I also like the idea that, you know, I think it's interesting because uh, in Asia, I think a lot of governments are giving grants, uh, literally free money, right, for all these companies to adopt uh, new technology capabilities. And, you know, if you look across, I mean, just from my perspective and my friends who are living in, I think Thailand, Malaysia, I think uh, even though uh, the pubs may be closed or they may not be open, but it doesn't mean that business is not coming because a lot of them have actually built up the e-commerce capabilities uh, subsequently where, you know, you have all these food deliveries. Um, so I do think that... Um, Based on this, this could be actually a blessing in the future for all these uh, restaurants because they get a free money and I think they become more resilient over time. And, you know, I can attest that uh, the pubs are, you know, really, really overflowing with people in Singapore, Malaysia, and in many parts of Asia as well. For sure. And Mark, you had your hand up real quick. You want, did you have thoughts on this? Yeah, just some feedback from Australia. When they like reopened the pubs, there was like a massive um, uh, and the restaurants, you know, a massive pent up demand there. But it fizzled out pretty quickly, like after a month or six weeks. So the feedback I got from a lot of people there was that once everything reopened, it was like literally like your busiest time of the year, whatever that may be, where it's like Thanksgiving, Christmas, or like in in the middle of like this point, it was like crazily busy. But then after that, it like literally died to kind of, I think, more reflect the economic situation that kind of, you know, the country was facing. And then, you know, it like it really quickly kind of reverted back to the economic condition. So, you know, just some kind of firsthand feedback for, for Sam. But I do agree with his point, you know, a lot of restaurants won't be around in a year's time and if you you know the ones who can stay in the game i think are definitely you know going to have more demand but the key thing also will be as he rightly points out is you know is there going to be a repricing of, of restaurant space by the by the landlords so so bobby uh so first of all congrats on getting such an impressive array of uh pub analysts here this is uh in one place this is like this is yeah this is like the all-star team like i was wondering why i was invited to this so the uh so um 
you know, another, so another you brought the beer. I know. I yes, I did. I came well prepared here too. So yeah, I got, so, I got beer in here. I swear. I, you know, I'll, I'll show everybody later. Okay. As soon as I saw Kevin on this, I was like, oh, I know why I was invited. Here it is. Where he's bringing out the experts. Yeah, yeah. So the Canelo place uh, on the restaurant subject um, is uh, in disclosure. I'm I'm long them a small position, but you can go up the value chain a bit too. So um, a very well trafficked. U.S. Uh, microcap, which I think a lot of people know is Armenino Foods, Disclosure Long. Um, and uh, they, a lot, most of their business is ultimately going to food away from home. They have some retail, they have some industrial, um, but a lot of it's food away from home. Um, that's a business where it got beat up. It's going to have not a good Q2. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if they're fully profitable Q3 and Q4. Um, but what's good about that business is you had a new CEO who entered, um, in February, uh, is he's got a sales growth focus. Uh, his time's maybe kind of perfect on that front and they have a lot of weakened competitors and they have a great balance sheet. I mean, they could, they have wide margins and a great balance sheet. So it's going to be really hard for them to lose money in the next two years and they can afford to. So so like, you know, it's not just looking at restaurants and pubs. It's also looking at people that supply them and you can find companies that are, that are great. Um, I think Armenino is one of the better companies out there. Um, so, you know, but they got to have the balance sheet to survive the bumps. Um, I think that that's definitely something you want. And ideally it's a business that you actually want to hold for a long time. I think that's a business that's, um, you know, you look at our historic ROE, their, their steady growth. I think it's worth owning. I'm less interested in the stuff that are quick hitters because if it doesn't go up, I'm stuck with it and I don't want to own it. Um, so it ends up a little tricky. Um, so. All right, guys, we're, you know, we're about there for the first episode. So I, I'd like to wrap up where everyone give, has a chance to give, you know, take 30 seconds and just give your final thoughts on what's going on and what you see happening or just your final thoughts in general about, you know, or anything really. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'll, I'll throw it back to Tom and then, uh, and then we'll, we'll go from there. Uh, yeah, no, no pressure, I guess. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, yeah, I don't know. I'm like, I'm actually quite optimistic. Um, I just think uh, if you're looking in enough different places, I think you can all, there's always something, there's always some work to do somewhere. Um, you know, when I was a younger investor, I, I, I think I wasn't looking enough places and so I couldn't find things sometimes and I got stuck in a lot of cash. And I think that that might be particularly dangerous the next 10 years. Um, you need to be patient. You need to not care if you're carrying a bunch of cash for a year or two, but ultimately if you're looking enough places, there's, there's lots of stuff out there. Um, so, you know, that's one thing I'd say. And, uh, um, that's also the last thing I'll say, I think here. So <laughs> go ahead, Bobby. There you go. And, uh, Adrian, yeah, well, first of all, let me just say, great, great panel. Thanks for organizing it. And it was great meeting everybody on this panel that I haven't met before. Some really great insights. Um, I'll just um, say two things, if I may, to conclude. One is, uh, I agree with, with Tom. I mean, I think these days you just have to look around the world. And I'm, I'm just staggered at people who, who restrict themselves to just one market, frankly. But um, the other thing I would say, um, I think it was Kelvin who mentioned something about, you, you know, sticking with your discipline. And I, I don't want to put words into your mouth, but I would say one of the things that to me is very, very important for investors is to have, a, have an approach, understand the approach, understand the benefits and the risks of that approach. Because every approach, if you're a momentum investor or a value investor, you know, there's positives and negatives, but understand the approach and the risks and, and kind of stick with it. That doesn't mean be, be dogmatic or be rigid or be, not be flexible, but, you know, don't be, a value, don't, don't be a momentum investor until the stock goes down and suddenly say, hmm, you know what, I'm really a, I'm really a value investor. Don't be a short-term trader and then when it goes against you, decide you're a long-term investor because that's the way you just get stuck with, with, with dogs. So understand, understand what you're doing, I guess is what I'm saying. Und understand your approach and, and then, um, you know, stick with it. Very good. Kelvin, final thoughts? 
Yeah, so it's a nice show. Uh, thanks, uh, Robert, for inviting. And, you know, I enjoyed listening to the viewpoints uh, from everyone. Um, my, my view is very simple. You know, look, you know, the market will do what the market will do. But I believe in the long term, you know, as long as we really stick to our discipline, you know, choose really good quality companies. I mean, we will definitely see speed bumps along the way. But, you know, beyond this short term, um, you know, if you look far ahead, you know, if our, if our perspective is a bit longer, I think the returns will be still very good. It's just that the returns do not come in like 20% every year, that sort of thing, or 40% every year. But it's more like on a longer term basis, if you average out your returns, I think it will be really great. Um, and one thing I found very useful is really, uh, you know, getting to know more people, um, you know, getting on phone calls, getting on Zooms like right now, um, you know, to share investment ideas, to be open-minded. And that's really where I do think that, you know, sometimes even after investing for several years, you know, we still may have our blind spots, but as we check in with one another and ask people, you know, what am I missing out? You know, how can I improve this thesis? Is there another way to think about this situation? I think that creates, a, um, you know, that, that produces a creative, a creative process which really helps in, uh, you know, improving ourselves um, every year, right? So that's, that's my uh, closing remarks. Thanks, Kelvin. All right, we're going to throw to Mark because it sounds, I think his twins might pop out at any second. So let's get your final thoughts before they, uh, they do join us today. Um, yeah, and I see Bobby, uh, he didn't make it to all the topics, so he's got some of us back here definitely again the next time um, because we, we didn't get to cover everything. But um, I think it was great. You know, I think there's some really interesting insights from, from people here. I think one of the things I've mentioned to Bobby before that I think is going to be a long-term result of this that's going to play out, you know, in a year, two, three years down the line is, you know, what I call like, you know, certain stocks are going to get a pandemic premium and that there's other stocks are going to get a disease discount where the market will, going forward, perennially attribute either a higher PE or a lower PE to, to, this, to this industry or to this sector, you know, you know, forever based on we could have another COVID situation, you know, whatever that might be. It might not be, you know, health today, but it could cause, you know, a kind of global economic shutdown for whatever reason. And I think that's something to think about of, you know, restaurants that they trade at, you know, this multiple before, will they ever get back to that multiple? Has the market actually said, no, we are never going to price them at this multiple as a kind of a whole grouping together, you know, and on the flip side, you know, for technology stocks, you know, maybe that's going to, you know, change you know, already high multiples to maybe an even higher kind of structural multiple. And I think that's something to kind of, as this whole thing washes through over the next 12, 24 months, is to think about where is this in the in the long-term scheme of things of premiums on uh, your, what PEs, you know, the market as a whole is willing to attribute to stocks and sectors. Perfect. All right, your own final thoughts? Yeah, um, great panel. Thanks for having us. I guess um, my main takeaway is that I don't want to have any more cash after listening to all you guys speak. You guys just scared me. Um, so I'm going to put it all to work tomorrow. Um, I'm just kidding. But I think, I mean, the, the takeaway, I, 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 the conclusion I come to when I speak to any like minded or intelligent, thoughtful investors is that I, I mean, I do personally think the overall market has run too far too fast but I do also think you can pick your spots and it you know if you um, are able to find just a handful of investments that um, are necessarily you know COVID being hurt by COVID that are reasonably valued then I think they're good spots to play and um, and avoid the ones that are getting hurt by COVID unless they offer you a very 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 uh, compelling margin of safety and you know a lot a ton of upside I guess I would say um, so that's kind of the conclusion I came to after talking to you all and um, and I, I think it's the right one so that's that's my strategy going forward but thanks for the time everyone thank you your own uh, Sam your thoughts yeah thanks first I want to say congrats Bobby on uh, your baby uh, thank you, you. Know, life has definitely changed for you quite a bit I'm sure in two in more ways than just one um, <laughs> Um, I would say like everyone talks about, you know, COVID and how the world's changed. I, I kind of see it a little differently. I see it as it's kind of accelerated. Um, you know, the, the push to digital has, has accelerated a bit. Um, I think bad businesses will go bankrupt. 
I think good businesses will, will be fine, if not better afterwards. Um, I think as a microcap investor, if I was new and I didn't really understand things really well, um, I think the biggest thing I think to, to focus on right now is the capital structure of companies and to really understand, um, you know, how, you know, what, what their debt actually looks like, how they actually have to pay it, when are cash payments due, when do shares get issued, you know, what about options outstanding, warrants outstanding. Um, in the microcap space, you know, you could find great investments in companies that make, will make more money in the future, but from dilution and other issues as such, you know, you, it, it won't really actually truly add value to the business. So I think that's really my, my main takeaway is, are those, are those two things. Gotcha. And Kevin, before you give your, your final uh, uh, thoughts real quick, are you a shareholder in uh, DGLY, Aspira and Duncan? I do not own DGLY. I do own uh, AWH and I do not own Duncan. Perfect. All right. Final thoughts. Um, two things. One is it's actually quite valuable to be speaking to a panel that actually has an international perspective. I thought it was pretty pretty interesting for me. That's uh, it's a, it's a, it's it, it opens it it opens it up a lot, and you, you'd be able to see a little bit better across the spectrum of what um, what people are thinking of. And secondly, is it started off with a question or an observation for your own about uncertainty, and I still think that that's probably going to be key over the next few years. And I go back to I'd, I'd like to take what he said with what Adrian said. And, and put them together and sit down and say is, check out uncertainty against your system. If you have a principled system and you're operating a strategy, don't change your strategy to accommodate the uncertainty, evaluate the uncertainty and how it affects your strategy. I think that, that's, a, that's a particularly interesting area because in trading, it's so funny because what happens is that when you speak to people, you speak to people who operate with different time frames, and if you're not coordinated in time frames, you can be completely talking over each other. Okay, uh, so I think that goes back down to is, um, is there is uncertainty, and uh, stick with your system and and uh, you know adapt as appropriate. If it means becoming a Robin Hooder, there you go. Well, with that, guys, thank you so much for joining us and joining this panel to all our panelists. I'll be putting everybody where you can find more information about them in the description of the video. So just be sure to look out for that. Um, and with that, thank you all. This has been the Investors Roundtable. My main tagline I'm working with is that you never know who's going to show up each week or what topic we're going to talk about each week. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, we didn't even get to a couple today, but we're going to get to them hopefully next week. And uh, guys, thank you again. I really appreciate it. Have a great weekend and uh, talk to you all soon. Thanks, Bobby. Thank, Thank you, you all. Be safe. Thank you.